From Chicago, Illinois, the Voice of Prophecy presents live The Midnight Cry with Kenneth Cox, an adventure in understanding where we are in the light of Bible prophecy.
Our Father in heaven, this evening as we open your word, we first, Lord, would ask that you would give us understanding. Lord, may our hearts be open. We pray that the Holy Spirit may be here to impress. We ask that each one of us may understand that thou art God and that each one of us need to just simply surrender our hearts to you and let you lead and guide and direct in our lives. Bless us as we study your word this evening. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Blind Man's Bluff is a game that's played by children where they take another child and they blindfold them and put them in a circle, in the middle of a circle, and then a child will hit them, touch them, and they try to guess who uh, touched them. Uh, that originally was not called Blind Man's Bluff. It was called Blind Man's Buff, and it was from the child hitting them. But over the years, it became known as Blind Man's Bluff. And today, that Blind Man's Bluff means when somebody uh, pulls the wool over our eyes, uh, somebody does something that uh, kind of tricks us or we don't really understand. And tonight's subject is a subject that, as far as I'm concerned, has kind of pulled the wool over people's eyes, and they haven't really seen it clearly. I had the privilege of working with an individual by the name of HMS Richards, Jr. In fact, I started in the ministry under him and spent several years working with him, and he told me that his grandfather one day uh, took him and set him on his knee, and he said to him, he said, Sonny, if I had a little lamb and I called his tail a leg, how many legs would he have? Oh, he said, five. He said, Sonny, if I had a little lamb and I called his tail a leg, how many legs would he have? And he said, five. He said, no, just because I call it something doesn't make it so. Okay, folks? Just because you call something, something doesn't necessarily make it so. And so tonight, we're going to look very carefully at a subject that is extremely important. Luke. Luke, the writer of the book of Luke and Acts, a physician. I want you to listen very carefully to what he says when he started out the book of Luke. And this is what he's saying in Acts about that. Notice. Acts 1.1. 1, 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Now, he's writing to Theophilus. He's writing in the book of Acts, and he said, I have recorded how much? Huh? All that Jesus began both to do and teach teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen he said I've written down all the things that Jesus began to do and teach from the time he started until he ascended back into heaven to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them dur during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he said, I have recorded, Theophilus, all the things that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Okay? So that makes it clear that in the book of Acts, Luke recorded those things. So the question that you and I need to look at this evening is, does the Scripture... Does the Scripture anywhere say that God blessed, hallowed, and sanctified the first day? Now that we've got to take a good look at. We need to be objective. We need to keep our hearts open. 
we need to ask ourselves, is there such scripture? If there is, Luke should have recorded it because he said, I recorded everything, okay? So let's take a look at Luke. He's a physician. Luke, in his writing, is more detailed than all the other writers. He writes and makes it very detailed. So we're going to take a look at the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to go to the 23rd chapter and start with verse 52, where it says, This man went to Pilate, asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and wrapped it in a tomb that was hewn out of a rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. So Luke is giving us account and he says that Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate, asked for the body of Jesus. It's been given to him. He has taken it, put it in the tomb. They have prepared it. And this was done on the preparation day or the day before the Sabbath. That's what the Scripture has told us clearly. We all understand that day to be what we call Good Friday. That's the day that Jesus died. Good Friday, the preparation days when he died. But watch, Luke is recording exactly what took place. So watch as Luke continues. Luke 23:55. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. And they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now I have people that say to me, Brother Cox, do you really think the Sabbath is important? I want to ask you a question tonight. If those women wouldn't even embalm the body of Jesus on the Sabbath. They went back home and they kept the Sabbath according to commandment. Then who am I to say it's not important? Hey. So it makes it very clear that the Sabbath comes right after the preparation day. The Sabbath comes right after that. That's what Luke is saying. The next day was the Sabbath. Luke continues in the 24th chapter, has this to say. Luke 24, verse 1, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing spices which they had prepared. So these women are coming to the tomb. They're coming when? Early in the morning, on the first day of the week. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So it says here they got there, they went in, Jesus wasn't there, he had risen from the grave. And we refer to that as first day of the week or Easter Sunday. There is nothing, folks, nothing in this text at all that says anything about God taking the first day of the week, blessing it, hallowing it, or sanctifying it. It just simply says that Jesus rose on the first day of the week. That's what it's telling us. Not any more than that. So there's nothing here. So with that, and Luke has recorded all that took place, but let's go on and take a look at what the other gospel writers have to say. You'll find that they pretty much say the same thing that Luke said. Matthew 28 and verse 1. Matthew 28, verse 1 now, after the, oh, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb after the Sabbath was over. They went home. They kept the Sabbath according to the commandment, right? And it says they are coming to the tomb when? They're coming early, early on the first day of the week. Now, do you know? when the Gospel of Matthew was written? You know when the Gospel of Matthew was written? Well, the Gospel of Matthew was written in 60 A.D. 60 A.D., folks. This happens to be 29 years after the death of Jesus. Okay, so the Gospel of Matthew is written 
29 years after the death of Jesus. If there had been a change in the day of worship, don't you think Matthew would have said something about it? Huh? Why, sure, if it, there had been a change there, Matthew would have recorded it and said something about it, but he doesn't say a word about it. And in the Gospel of Matthew, there is nothing that says that he blessed, hallowed, or sanctified the first day of the week. So with that, let's go to the Gospel of Mark. Mark, the 16th chapter, verse 1. Now when the Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. So it says that these women are coming early on the first day of the week, and they're coming to the tomb for what purpose? To anoint him. They are not coming, folks, for the purpose of worship. They're coming for the purpose of anointing him. Why are they coming so early? I mean, another text will tell us they're coming at the rising of the sun. Why are they coming so early? Well, they're coming early because he's been dead several days. They know that time is of the essence. They know they need to take care of his body quickly now because rigor mortis is set in. Also, they know that they need to do their work while it's cool, not while it's hot. And they also know that this is hard, hard work. Do you have any idea? How many pounds of spices and ointment and that type of thing that it took to prepare someone's body for burial back then? Well, it took 300 pounds, 300 pounds just to prepare somebody's body for burial. And so it says very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They're getting there because they know they have to do it quickly. They have to take care of it because he's been dead several days. The scripture says that Nicodemus, Nicodemus himself furnished 100 pounds of those spices. That's what the scripture says. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and alloys about a... 100 pounds, John 19, 39. So Nicodemus himself furnished 100 pounds of it. So this, what I'm just trying to get across to you is they're coming, they don't think he's risen, they're coming there to work. There is nothing here in the Gospel of Mark that says anything about God taking that day, blessing it, hallowing it, or sanctifying it. Nothing there, folks. So... It, one other text here in the Gospel of Mark, the 16th chapter, verse 9, and it says, Now when he arose early on the first day of the week, do you know how early that is? When it says Jesus rose early the first day of the week? Well, how early that is, it's still dark. I'll show you a text in just a little bit. He, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, so he appeared to her first. But let's go on to the Gospel of John, see what it says. It says, out of Mary, he had cast seven demons. John 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. She gets there while it's still dark. When she gets there, she finds that the stone's already been rolled away and that he's risen and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she's gotten there early. For anybody else, Christ has already risen from the grave. Nothing here, folks, nothing here in the Gospel of John that says that God blessed, hallowed, sanctified it. In fact, it goes on in John 20, verse 2, and says, Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken away the, the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. They said, he's taken away. We don't know what they have done with him. Nothing there. One more text, 
in the Gospel of John. Listen carefully because I find some people use this text as a premise for keeping the first day of the week. This is what it says. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now it says the disciples are meeting in this room for what purpose? For worship? No, they're meeting fear of the Jews. They're afraid that they're going to be taken, that they might be crucified as he was. So basically what that text is telling us is they're hiding. That's what they're doing when Jesus appears to them on the first day of the week. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then his disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Nothing here, folks, that says that he blessed, hallowed, or sanctified the first day of the week. That is all the texts there are in the Gospels that mention the first day of the week. That's it. Okay? There are only three more in the Bible. One in the Old Testament, that's all. There's only one text in the whole Old Testament that mentions the first day of the week. There's two more in the New Testament. I want you to listen very carefully because on these next two in the New Testament, probably 85% of all the reasons it's given for worshiping on the first day of the week rest on those two texts. So we need to look at them very, very careful. The first one's found in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, starting here with verse 1, and it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches in Galatia, so you must do also. All right, a collection for who? For the saints. All right, so Paul is writing out to the believers in Corinth, and he wants to take a collection for the saints. On the first day of the week, okay, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. So Paul's writing them. He tells them on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside as God has prospered that person, that there be no collections when I come. So this is what Paul has written out. What is the background? What's the circumstances here? Let's get an idea of what it is. The Scripture will help us understand exactly what the background is because it tells us here, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 3, When I come, whoever you approve by your own letter, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. So Paul said, When I come, on the first day of the week, you should lay something aside as God's prospered you so there'll be no collections when I come. And he said, whoever you choose, we'll give this gift to him and he can take it to Jerusalem. That's what Paul has told him. Now, why? Well, this is what's going on, folks. This is what's taking place at that time. Acts 11, verse 27. And in these days, prophets came from... Where's the gift going to? going to Jerusalem. The gift's going to Jerusalem. These prophets are coming from where? From Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them's name, Agabus. Think, remember that name. We're going to come back to that name yet again tonight. One of these prophets named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine, okay, throughout the world which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So he's been shown by God there's going to be a great famine. That famine, folks, is in progress. And the believers down in Jerusalem are having a very, very hard time. And so Paul has asked the believers at Corinth to give, to give some help to the believers down in Jerusalem, and he gave them instructions about doing that. Then the disciples each according to his ability, ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. So they made that decision. They were going to send a gift to help them. 
This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Okay, let's go back to that text and begin to put some things together about it because we need to see what it says. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. I have highlighted the words, lay something aside. Folks, that does not mean at church. I have some people read that text and they say, well, that says you're to take your offering to the church on Sunday. No, that does not. In fact, that text says, really, you need to lay something aside at home, is what it's actually saying, that there be no collections when I come. Eight translations of the Bible say privately or at home. Lay something aside at home. Paul said... uh, You need to lay something aside at home as God's prospered you so there'll be no collections when I come. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. What does he mean, no collections? They're not going to take an offering? Is that what that's saying? No, that's not what that's saying, folks. You see, back then, they used what was called the bartering system. They still do over there to this day. Uh, For instance, if you uh, had a bushel of wheat and you needed uh, a couple bushels of corn, you could take that down and swap it at the market for a couple bushels of corn. Or you might have a chicken and you might take it down to the market and swap it for a half a bushel of wheat. Paul said... As God has prospered you. He's, what he's really saying, folks, is if you have a bushel of wheat you want to give or a bushel of corn or this type of thing for the folks down in Jerusalem, lay that aside, have it ready, so there's no collections when I come, so that we don't have to gather all that up. That's what Paul's saying to them. Lay it aside so it's ready, so that we don't have to wait for you to gather all this up. Now, let's take some look. Let's take a look at what this text says so we're very clear as to what it's telling us. Does the passage say the first day is a day of worship or a holy day? Does it say that? No, there's nowhere in that passage that it says that it is a day of worship or a holy day. Does not say that. Doesn't say that God blessed it, hallowed, or sanctified it. Secondly, Does it command God's people together on the first day for church service? Does it do that? No, that isn't there either. It doesn't command the people to worship on the first day of the week. That's not there. Thirdly, does it say they were meeting each first day for worship? No, it doesn't even say that. It doesn't say they were meeting every first day for worship, so that's not there. All right. Does the passage refer to a public meeting? No, it says lay by at home as God has prospered you. So that doesn't apply either. So you can see this text is not talking about a day of worship. It's not talking about a day being set aside as a day of worship. It's talking about them looking over how God has blessed them. In other words, they've gone all week long. They've gone all week long. They've kept the Sabbath. The very first opportunity they've had to look over how God has blessed them that past week was on the first day of the week. And he said, sit down, look it over. If God has blessed you in a special way and you want to give an offering for the poor in Jerusalem, set that aside. That's all that text is saying. All right, one more. This one's found in Acts 20. Start with verse 7. Notice what it says. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread... Paul, ready to depart the next day. I want to get some things clear as we go along here. This meeting is happening on what day of the week? Huh? First day of the week. All right. The disciples have gathered together for what purpose? To break bread. We'll come back and look at that. Paul is ready to depart the next day. All right. Well, we passed one up. But it says, there were many lights in the upper room where they were gathered together. 
There were many lights in the upper room. This meeting is taking place what time of day? Nighttime. So their upper room, their meeting, it's a night meeting, all right? And in the window sat a certain young man named Eutychus who was seeking into a deep sleep who was overcome by sleep. This young man sitting in the window. This meet, meeting, folks, is taking place on the third story. That's what the Scripture says. It's a warm summer evening, and he's evidently sitting in the window and uh, says that he fell into a deep sleep, okay? And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. So he went to sleep, fell out of the window, and it killed him. Now, there's two things to be learned from this passage. One is, don't go to sleep on the preacher. It's dangerous, okay? The other thing is, the preacher shouldn't be long-winded either, okay? But the boy fell out of the window, took his life. Paul goes down and prays for him. Then Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is any. All right? Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. Okay? And they brought the young man alive, and they were not a little comforted. So it says he fell out of the window. It was about midnight. Uh, his life was restored to him. They went up, back upstairs, had something to eat, and they talked all night long. The next morning, Paul leaves. Okay, let's put together some facts about this meeting. This is what time of day? Nighttime. It's a night meeting. There's many lights in the upper chamber. So this is definitely a night meeting. Secondly, this takes place on Paul's third missionary journey. If you take a look at this map, you'll find that this is Paul's third missionary journey here. And this incident that we're talking about tonight took place up there in a place called Troas. That's where this incident took place. This is Paul's last missionary journey, folks. The last one he ever made. You've got to make sure you understand that. Paul has gone clear down here into Greece, down into Corinth, Athens, all the way down there. All right? Watch. Paul is going to where? Now, let me tell you what's happening. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is taking place in Jerusalem. Paul knows that there's going to be Jewish people there from all over the nation. He knows that this will be an excellent opportunity for him to talk to Jewish people about Jesus Christ. So he feels that he has to go to Jerusalem because he wants to talk to people about Jesus Christ. Well, the Holy Spirit has told Paul, if you go on to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound and taken to Rome. Holy Spirit has already told that. Holy Spirit does not tell Paul, don't go. He just telling Paul, what's going to happen to him if he does. But Paul is under conviction that he needs to go to Rome. All right, let's go on. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named... Okay, here he is again, Agabus, came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So Paul knows, folks, what is before him. No question about it. So do the believers. You've got to remember that. So do the believers. This church at Troas, Paul raised up. He's the one that started that church. Those people love him. He has spent the weekend there with them. That's what he's doing. This meeting 
is a farewell meeting for Paul. That's what it is. It's a farewell meeting for Paul. These people know they're never going to see him again. They know that. So, what's happening? Well, Paul has some companions with him. He has Luke and Silas and Timothy. He tells them to go ahead of him and catch the ship and sail to Asos. Then we went ahead to ship, that's his companions, and sailed to Asos, there intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. How's that possible? How's it possible that they could go ahead and catch the ship, sail to Asos, and Paul says, I'll go by foot and catch you? How, how could that be? Well, let's see. If you're looking here at Troas, you'll find that this is a peninsula. And what just simply happened is he told his companions, you go ahead and catch the ship, you sail from Troas around the peninsula over to Asos. Sunday morning, I'll walk across the peninsula and catch you in Asos, which was 20 miles. And that's exactly what he did. Okay, so that's what's happening here. Why did Paul tell him, you go ahead? You go ahead and catch the ship. I'll spend the night here with the believers because it's a farewell meeting for Paul. That's why they stayed up all night, folks, is because they know they're not going to see him. That's also why I believe when it says that they broke bread, I believe that refers to celebrating the Lord's Supper because I can't think of anything I would rather do if I was never going to see people again, and I knew I would never see them again, I can't think of anything nicer than to celebrate the Lord's Supper with them. So Paul celebrated the Lord's Supper with them, spent all night with them. Sunday morning, he takes out and walks 20 miles over to Asos to catch the ship there. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to part the next day, that was Sunday morning, spoke to them, continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. So this is a night meeting. They spend all night there. All right, now let's look at something. This is the only text, folks, in the Old Testament that mentions the first day of the week but it has a very important point. Genesis 1, verse 5, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, there's certainly nothing in that text that says that God blessed, hallowed, or sanctified the first day of the week. It's just simply saying on the first day of the week, God created the light and the darkness. But he tells you something very important. He tells you when the day starts. And when it ends, it says there, the what? So the evening and the morning were the first day. The scripture tells you that the day begins at sunset. That's what it's saying. The day begins at sunset and goes to sunset. That's the way God made it. And as you read the scripture, you'll find that over and over that the Bible's simply telling you that the day starts here at sunset goes to sunset. Now, my point. If this is the first day of the week, which it is, the first day of the week, and it's in the dark part of the first day of the week, then when is it? Has to be Saturday night. You see, because the first day of the week starts on Saturday night. Sunset Saturday night to sunset Sunday is the first day of the week. If you move it to Sunday evening, that's the second day of the week. Now you say, well, Brother Cox, are you really sure about that? Well, let me show you the way the New English Bible translates it. This is what it says. Well, let me give you another one. Leviticus 23, 32, excuse me, 
says, From evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. That means from sunset to sunset you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Okay, now the statement from the New English Bible. It's Acts 20, verse 7, and it says, On the Saturday night in our assembly for the breaking of bread. See, Bible scholars recognize that night meeting was Saturday night. Had to be in order to be the first day of the week. So what I'm trying to tell you folks is there is nothing here in this scripture that says that God blessed, God hallowed, or God sanctified the first day of the week. In fact, the Bible says that the first day of the week is a work day. Did you know that? It's what the Bible says. Ezekiel 46, 1, Thus saith the Lord God, The gateway of the inner court that faces towards the east shall be shut the... How many? Six working days. But on the Sabbath it shall be open, and on the day of the new moon it shall be open. So the Scripture says very clearly that the first day of the week is a work day. That's all the Scripture there are, folks. There's not any more. Now, we live in a day of computers. Uh, you know, I have to travel because I travel a lot. I cannot haul my library with me. Impossible. I'd love to, but I can't. Fortunately... Computers make it possible that you can have your library in your computer. You can get all kinds, you know, all books, lots of books in a computer. And, of course, I have my Bible in the computer. And so what I did is I just simply asked the computer on my Bible in the computer. I said, give me all the texts in the Bible that mention the first day of the week. And it printed them out for me. That's what I just shared with you. These are all the texts in the Bible that mention the first day of the week. Nine of them, right there, all listed, okay? Then I said to the computer, give me all the texts in the Bible that mention the Sabbath. And it did. I'd like to share them with you. Now, if you want to see on which side the amount of evidence is, it's quite obvious, see, that God never, never blessed, never hallowed the, ser the first day of the week. So, I guess what we need to ask is, since God never blessed, hallowed, or sanctified any other day than the Sabbath, and that there are no texts in the Bible that support the claim that Sunday is a holy day, there's not any, then what brought about the change? Let me read some statements to you. These are statements by other beliefs. This is by Dr. Edward Hiscock, the author of the Baptist Manual. I want you to listen to what he has to say. There was and is a commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day, said there was. But the Sabbath day was not Sunday. It will be said, however, and with some show of triumph, that the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week with all of its duties and privileges and sanctions. Earnestly desiring information on this subject, which I have studied for many years, I ask where can the record of such a transaction be found? Not in the New Testament, absolutely not. There is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. That's what he says. Quite clear where he stands. What brought about the change? Why do we have that today? What brought about the change? Well, the Jewish people are in revolt against Rome. If you have never read about it, then I would invite you to read about it. Read about Masada. 
and some of those things, and it will tell you about the revolt of the Jewish people against the Roman Empire. Because they were in revolt against the Roman Empire, the Romans sent soldiers in and they killed, slaughtered the Jewish people. But since the Christians, since the Christians kept the Sabbath as well as did the Jews, they slaughtered Christians. And so in an effort to try to show a difference between the Jews and the Christians, some of them started keeping the first day of the week. That's what brought about a change. No scripture for this, folks. No scripture at all, but just simply trying to make a distinction. And so you find many Christians kept the Sabbath and they kept Sunday both. But by the time you reach 300 A.D., almost half of the Roman Empire is now Christian. Christianity has spread that much. The emperor's name is Constantine. Constantine can see that it would be politically advantageous for him to become a Christian. So he tells the people that he had a dream. In the dream, he saw a cross and that he was going to become a Christian. Never did. But he even took his army and marched them through the river and told them they had all been baptized and were now Christians. But in order to make Christianity appealing to the pagan, that's what he's trying to do, to make Christianity appealing to the pagan, Constantine signed into effect what was known as the Edict of Constantine, 321 A.D. Listen to it. Constantine, the Roman emperor, attempted to unite his empire on the venerable day of the sun. Let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest and let all workshops be closed. Church leaders accepted this. In fact, Constantine even put a penalty on it if they didn't do that. The church leaders, after a period of time at the Council of Laodicea, they accepted that. And thus you find now the state is enforcing the keeping of the first day of the week. This is what history tells us. Council of Laodicea. Christians shall not Judaize, that means keep the Sabbath, and be idle on Saturday, Sabbath originally, but shall work on that day but the Lord's day they shall especially honor. That was the stand that the council of Laodicea took. And so you find that the change came. Gradually over the centuries, Sunday was accepted in the place of the Bible Sabbath. And so you and I today, because of tradition, many of you like myself were brought up keeping Sunday, didn't know any different. It's the way I was taught from the time I was a child. But when I picked up God's Word and I began to look in the Scripture, I began to find it was strangely absent. Just wasn't there. And I had to take a good look at it and say, what what does the Bible say? What does it teach here? Many religious leaders have understood this Some have made very strong statements about it. This is a statement, the creeds of Christendom, Philip Schaff. This is a statement, folks, made by Martin Luther. This is made by Martin Luther. I want you to listen. The Catholics allege the Sabbath changed into Sunday. said that's what they say, the Lord's Day, contrary to the... Decalogue as it appears. Say that's contrary to the Decalogue. Neither is there any example more boasted of than the changing of the Sabbath day. Great, says they, is the power and the authority of the church since it dispensed with the Ten Commandments. They said, that's there. That's Luther's own statement. So there are many church leaders quite 
well aware that this is what took place. If you want to take a look at the Bible and look at it, what it has to say, it will tell you clearly there is no other day but the Sabbath. In fact, it refers to the Sabbath all the way through as the Sabbath of the Lord. It does not say the Sabbath of the people. It says it is the Sabbath of the Lord. Because he's the one that gave it. He's the one that made it. Another statement. Canon and traditions. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the Scripture because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday, not by a command of Christ, but by its own authority. That is what the Catholic Church says. That's their statement. So to you, they're here tonight, those of you who are watching by television, I would just simply say to you that you have to look at God's Word and decide where you're going to build your faith. If you're going to build your faith on church, is that where you're going to build it? Let me tell you something. You never, never, never find truth by a church. You don't find it there. I don't care what church you're talking about. You don't find truth by the Baptists. You don't find truth by the Methodists. You don't find it by the Presbyterians. You don't find it by the Lutherans. You don't find it by the Catholics. You don't find it by Seventh-day Adventists. You do not find truth by a church. You find truth by the Word of God. That is where you must build your faith. You see, if I'm going to start out here and say, well, I'm going to build my faith on a church, that's a long road, friend, because there are over 300 major denominations. You're going to go through all 300 of them to make sure you got the truth? No, you can't do that. You've got to build your belief on the Word of God. I've got to stand here. I've got to say, this is what the Word of God teaches. This is where I stand. And if I will stand solidly on the Word of God, you'll never be let down. You know, once you build your faith on the book, you never have to say, well, uh, you know, it reads the same every time. You can believe it. You can stand there. And I can tell you tonight that God will wonderfully, marvelously bless you if you'll stand on the Word of God. He won't fail. He won't let you down. He'll be there. He'll guide and direct your life in a very, very definite way. I can tell you. I can tell you out of experience. When I came face to face with this question, I was 17 years old. Some of the things that you are seeing here, the ideas were given to me as just a young man. Because a man came to our house and he took a window shade, an old pull-down window shade. You know what I'm talking about? And he had painted in color all these prophecies that I've been talking to you about. And he would come and roll that out across our living room floor and teach us. And it was from him that I came face to face with the question of the Sabbath. I was 17 years old. My father became violently opposed. Opposed enough that every time I went to church on the Sabbath, when I came back, he whipped me. Uh, I didn't have to take it. I was 17 years old. My father was crippled. But I stood there and I took it. 
week after week after week. And I will tell you tonight, if I had to do it over, I'd do it again. Because God simply promises that if you and I will stand with him and believe him, take him for what he says, that he will bless you and bless you abundantly. And I can tell you right now tonight, if I had my life to live over again, I'd do exactly what I have done because I have seen the hand of God. I've seen how he's blessed over and over and he'll bless your life in a very special way if you just follow him. Where he leads me please take that white card that you received when you came in this evening. If you don't have one, folks, please raise your hand. Our ushers will give you one. We'd like everybody to have one. Three questions tonight that I'd like for you to look at with me. First question says, I can see man has tried to change the Sabbath, not God. If you can see, there's been an effort on the part of man to change the Sabbath, but God certainly hasn't changed it. Then put a check by number one. Second question, I'd like to follow the Lord in keeping the Sabbath. Let me take just a moment on this, folks. Keeping the Sabbath will not save you. I want to make that clear. Keeping the Sabbath will not save you. It's accepting Jesus Christ that saves you, folks. You understand, it's accepting Him. It's giving your heart to Christ that saves you. The Sabbath won't save you. Why do I keep the Sabbath? Because the Scripture says that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He's the one that gave it. He's the one that said, keep it. And because I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I keep it. See, that's the reason. It doesn't save you. I keep it because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And he's Lord of the Sabbath. If you understand that, put a check by number two. Number three, I'd like to receive more information on the Sabbath. If you would like more information on the subject, then be sure and put a check by number three. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. May God be with each of you as we look at what his word has revealed. And pray, Lord, that you will bless each one. May they find comfort. May they find strength in you. That you will guide and direct their lives. That they may reach out in faith, take hold of your hand, walk with you all the way into the kingdom. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.